Thank you, Joe. Thank you very much, Joe and Professor Acombo, for this wonderful invitation at this uh, terrific inaugural conference. I was just going to make the motion, since speech doesn't do it like music does, maybe we'll forego this talk and just have Judith come back and sing a little more. What do you think? Can we have a show of hands for Judith? All right. How many of you were here yesterday at the uh, ABT conference? Oh, terrific. So we, we have a little bit of context. Um, it was a terrific conference with Alex and, and Don Campbell. Um, what I put up in the slide here is a photograph from Time Life, which was one of their 2001 Time Life photographs of the year. And it was taken within a week or so of the United States Army driving the Taliban out of Afghanistan. Um, and to the right here, you see a mob um, going to the cinema in Kabul for the first time. This is the first time in 13 years that women were allowed to dance or sing. So this is a young woman at her wedding a few days in Kabul after the Taliban were driven out. Um, and I show these slides in particular to remind us of the universality of music, the universal competence of humans to apprehend emotion and meaning in music. There is no culture that's ever been uh, known, either present or past, to be without music. Uh, and when we start to talk about the biology of music, we're particularly interested in establishing the universality of different aspects of music perception and cognition among listeners, and also innateness. Those, those two are key foundational elements of the biology of music, the universal competence in apprehending emotion and meaning, and the innateness of our ability to acquire effortlessly um, and without conscious effort the um, syntax of music, the phonology of music, many of the things that we say as we apply it to language or that Noam Chomsky would apply to language, uh, we can apply to music, although in a, in a different sense. Um, now the next slide, I'm going to do a little tachistoscopic presentation. Hopefully we'll get to a split brain experiment, which involves using a T-scope. So I'm going to flash a picture to you and then ask you if you recognize it. OK, we ready? OK, anybody recognize that uh, picture that flashed by there, Vera? Vera, what, you recognize that at all? Yeah, album cover of Sgt. Pepper's, Dr. Campbell. There was a catalog uh, done, the parody of that, that had uh, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band on it. Yeah. And uh, like OK, so this is the back cover of the Molecular Biology of the Cell, <laughs> edition three. And, I show, and they do a series. Like, each edition is a different Beatles album cover. There are a lot of Beatles fanatics in the fan. I happen to be one of them. I don't think I'd be doing this if it weren't for the Beatles. Um, and I learned at dinner last night just how many um, of us uh, have been influenced by them, even generations after mine. Um, but this is the president of the National Academy of Sciences in Washington, who's the lead editor. And I just bring this up to you, well, for two reasons. One is music permeates science and medicine. There are so many scientists and so many physicians who have a music background and a love of music. So in many ways, those of you who are thinking about making inroads into the fields of medicine and science with music, you have a little bit of a captive audience. There are a lot of, of uh, people in the field who really have a love for music. And most of us, if not all of us, who've contributed to the field do have a music background, although the number of rockers and jazz musicians are precious few, mostly classicists, um, as you might expect. Um, and the second reason I show this slide is to thank um, the members of the board of the Institute for Music and Brain Science. And yes, Don, it's easy to put people's heads on these things. Uh, Ann Young, one of the founding members and the chair at uh, the Department of, Neuro of Neurology at Massachusetts General Hospital. I think my laser pointer is going. If you have a backup laser point pointer, I could, I could use one. Um, oh, here we go. That's Ann here. 
Um, David Hubel, who won the Nobel Prize, actually didn't have to superimpose his face. Um, it was there. Uh, George Martin, the Beatles producer, a member of our um, founding board, Jamie Singleton, um, Caroline Beanstock, who um, is the COO of uh, the world's largest independent music publishing company. And without the support of these board members, um, I wouldn't be here today. And I also want to acknowledge the Grammy Foundation for supporting some of the research that uh, we've done at the Institute. One of the um, interesting, thank you, Joe. Um, when we talk to neuroscientists about, you know, why study music? Why, why look at the neuroscience of music? Well, in many ways, it grew out of the subdiscipline of neuroscience called cognitive neuroscience. And if we look at the brain through the perspective of music, we can address many of the things about brain function um, that other areas of cognitive neuroscience can. Auditory perception and cognition in particular, motor skill acquisition and performance, multimodal integration, learning and memory, uh, communication and semiotics or the study of meaning, uh, emotion, but we go a little bit beyond, I think, in music. We offer a little bit more to the field of neuroscience because we can start to address questions about aesthetics, about talent and creativity. Those are really things that have been outside the reach of neuroscience, and it's really only by studying the arts from a neuroscience perspective that we can begin to talk about a neuroscience of aesthetics, a neuroscience of creativity. So it's a very rich medium for applying the scientific method to learn about all of these higher brain functions and in addition, the brain functions that apply to the arts. And this has helped to fuel the interest in the field over the past uh, 10 to 20 years. I got into it because I was interested in auditory perception via music perception. And if you're interested in hearing, it's not just about perception, it's about auditory cognition, how context influences speech perception, how context influences music perception. And in the nonverbal domain, music is uh, like environmental sound uh, perception and recognition is really what we have to study nonverbal auditory processing, in a sense, tonal information processing, which is how I originally got into the field. And of course, there are implications for the diagnosis and treatment of uh, brain and ear diseases, which we heard a lot about yesterday and we'll hear more about today, um, yesterday in the ABT conference and today in um, this uh, quantitative uh, research in music and medicine conference. Now, it's not as simple as the old phrenologists in the 19th century had led us uh, to believe, or at least people at that time to believe, when we talk about the functional organization of the human brain, a lot of it gets into the world of localization. All right, and you see a lot of these colored images now in the press with fMRI or PET scans, if you look at stroke images, there's um, a, a motif within the field about where is a particular brain function. Um, of course, the phrenologists, they said tune was here in the right or left frontotemporal region. You know, oddly, they weren't too far off, but this, this sort of application doesn't apply. And because this is a quantitative research um, conference, I want to go through some of the approaches over the past couple of hundred years that have been used to try and come to some conclusions about brain organization in relation to function. So first of all, we have anecdote. Oh, I had this patient, and it's sort of Oliver Sacks tales of music in the brain. Oh, I had this patient, I saw this, so it must be that, right? In, in today's century, that's not acceptable, okay? It's useful because you have to have a rational approach to generate working hypotheses that you can test experimentally. It's not that there's no role for rationalism or anecdote, but in today, what's required of us today, if we're gonna make headway in this field, is to get away from these um, old-fashioned methods. Another one is introspection. So George Wundt, um, even the great uh, Hermann Helmholtz, 
uh, in his book um, on the sensation of tone as a physiological basis for the theory of music, um, he used introspection. You know, I played this interval to myself, it sounded dissonant, roughness is the basis of dissonance, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't fly anymore. You have to do a study with unbiased listeners to get at that. What the current scientific method, the philosophy of science involves are two basic principles. One is called verificationism and the other is called falsificationism. Falsification theory being um, proposed and popularized by Karl Popper, uh, an Austrian-born English philosopher. And the idea of falsification theory, you may know it in terms of the null hypothesis, is before you do the experiment, this is the biggest sin of all the functional imaging or many of the functional imaging experiments, before you do the experiment, based on rational grounds, intuition, introspection, and so forth, you clearly state a hypothesis. For example, we're going to look at today, a hypothesis would be the auditory cortex is essential for normal pitch and harmony perception. And then one has to go and do an experiment, make planned observations in a controlled environment that attempts to disprove your hypothesis. And if you fail to disprove the hypothesis that supports the hypothesis and allows me to say the auditory cortex plays an essential role in pitch and harmony perception. That's the approach. And as you, many of you know, this has not been the approach when we talk about music therapy and music related therapy. And this is exactly um, what professors Akambo and Rosowski are trying to get at that to develop a society and a field and a track whereby this sort of philosophy of science is applied to the therapeutic uses of music and listening. So testable hypotheses um, are good. Um, of course, you, you may know from the pharmaceutical uh, literature that the drug development approach is something called the randomized controlled clinical trial. Um, and I'll show you a, a randomized controlled clinical trial that um, my group did uh, with premature infants and how we went about the methods of doing that. But the basic idea is that you have to have a test group where you're testing your uh, testable hypothesis. And then a control group, for example, there's one way to do it, a control group that's similar to the test group in every way, in every possible way, and you have a number of predefined measurements that you're going to make after testing the hypothesis and then compare the results from the control group to the test group using statistical methods to show a certain amount of probability that your hypothesis has been proven. All right, so it's, it's much more difficult and <clears throat> doesn't exclude the one-on-one -on -one psychotherapy type of interaction. That's, that's important in its own right. But if we're going to start getting third-party payers to support the kind of work that we want to do, uh, if we're going to publish our papers in peer-reviewed journals that are read by physicians who are often in positions of authority to enact the kinds of treatments that we're trying to promote in this conference, we have to play by these rules. We're not going to make any inroads unless we test hypotheses, we do randomized controlled clinical trials, and we publish them in peer-reviewed professional journals. Now, what are peer-reviewed professional journals? For those of you in music, it's a sort of the equivalent of the audition. Um, anonymously, two or more experts read your paper and tear it apart and um, you have to survive that criticism, revise your paper. If you don't do it adequately, you do not get published. You may go to another journal and try them, and there is a pecking order of professional journals. So, you know, getting a music-related study into the New England Journal of Medicine would be sort of the holy grail. Right? That's not going to happen right away. And there are ways of dealing with this. Uh, we mentioned yesterday that there's now a new journal that Sage published